Okay, so we're recording. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is our COVID-19 update of June the 5th, 2020. And it's astonishing how much has happened in one week. And what we're gonna talk about is how we start with the sheltering place due to the coronavirus. We start reopening of America in the beaches. And unfortunately we've had riots and a lot of problems there. Unfortunately, all of that is feeding each other. So we'll talk about some of the consequences of of all of that ecosystem we're dealing with right now. So let's look at the weekly update agenda there. Lots of things happening there. Uh, we'll talk about the pandemic worldwide, a lot of things happening in South America, in India. There's a bit of an upsurge in America. We'll, we'll do a deep dive on that. Uh, there's some new information on how the virus uh, is attacking the blood vessels. And we'll talk about reopening, some good news about the employment market today that just went up unexpectedly. And, and also some tip on mental health. As you can see, there's a lot of anxiety in the country in there that's expressed in multiple ways. So, uh, so if you see at the high level there, um, Asia and South America are really accelerating. And we'll do a deep dive in which country they are. North America, uh, which is mostly the US, is kind of flat. Uh, Europe is clearly on the recovery phase, and unfortunately, we see Africa going up. So let's take a let's take a little bit uh, into more detail. So on a worldwide basis, we now have passed the point where we're doing hundred thousand new cases a day. That is a stunning number um, compared to where we started. Several of you were involved for the last several weeks, and you can see in the number of cases, it's clearly accelerating where I think a couple of weeks ago, it was a little bit on the flat side. And you see countries like Brazil now are number two in the world. They're now growing faster than the US in the daily cases. Unfortunately, you start seeing countries like India who wasn't on the dashboard a couple of weeks ago, who have emerged and unfortunately are growing very fast. And you see countries like Peru and Mexico, all new hotspots who are growing there. So on a worldwide basis, we're not doing well. And it's clearly now across the world, except Antarctica. So 188 countries and now have the virus. So pretty much everywhere. Let's take a deeper dive. We now for the first time have top 100,000 cases per day. And you can see what the growth is coming. It's Latin America and Central America, as well as Asia. Uh, you, uh, North America is kind of flat and Europe is clearly on the descending side. And unfortunately, you see Africa just starting to come. And remember, the data in Africa, uh, you know, maybe totally underestimating the number of patients. So if you look at the daily reported death as a percentage, you can see that the, the growth rate in the deaths, and we'll talk more about that, is in Latin America. The mortality rate there is significantly higher than the U.S. So if you look on the normalized cases by million, which is one of the best way to look at the data so that you don't have a difference in population rate, you can see that Brazil on the number of cases per million is catching up with the US in the number of cases growing extremely fast. If you look at new cases per million, it's extremely high. Now look at Peru and Chile, they are exploding in new cases per million. So you have really, three hot spots in the middle of the country there, and Mexico now is just coming up, which we never talk about Mexico until this week. So unfortunately, India, it's in its early phase, so we have to see what happens there, but we don't want to lose control of India because that's a very high population, very high density. Remember, we have this hot spot graphic there where the very, very big dark red is where you're having uh, you know, the growth uh, of the number of new cases, and the green or the light blue is basically a major drop in the number of new cases. So the good news is Europe is clearly in the recovery phase. They've done a great job in kind of recovering that. Uh, the US, we are getting better, but still some hot spot, and we'll talk about a little bit of an uptick going on the last few weeks since we reopened. Unfortunately, you can see that South America and Central America are still getting worse. And so that's a major concern because that means the virus is going to move to the Southern hemisphere and has a very high risk. I think pretty much every experts now expect this to come back next winter because now it has found a nice hot spot to grow. 
This is new. You can see that Africa is just starting there. On the left side, the curve is the percent of GDP that is basically exposed to the virus. So you can see that in Europe and US, pretty much the whole country was exposed and we had to shut down the economy there. It is impossible for countries like Africa and Central America to shut down their economy. So we may see a significantly higher mortality rate than we saw in Europe and the US. So if you look at the number of daily cases, clearly on the upswing, and, and you reported day by day, and I think it's because right now it's still dominant in the US and Europe, it's still on down week, but we have to see what's gonna happen in the next couple of weeks. Now, this is an interesting graphic, and it shows the mortality rate on the left axis. You can see Europe at a very high mortality rate compared to the age group. And in Europe, you had a high mortality rate mostly for the elderly. What we're finding out in South America is the mortality rate are for young people. Now, part of that is a demographic of that population is a younger population. But look at Mexico, 25% of the deaths are between people of the age of 25 to 49 years old. And what are the causes? I don't think it's the age group, it's really the social demographics, high population density, higher uh, poverty, higher prevalence of comorbidity like diabetes, obesity, and hypertension, which we know is linked with high fertility rate, and overall poor access to healthcare. So I think the big worry we have in the coming weeks is that as the virus is really expanding in these countries there, we may see a drastic increase in mortality rate. And you can see US as a whole had a younger population, we'll talk about that, uh, compared to the US and a significant low mortality rate, which may be due to the good uh, healthcare system we have here. If we look in the last seven days, which is a nice way to see where are the new hotspot emerging in the world. So it's kind of average as opposed to day to day. What you can see is now Brazil has the highest daily case in the world. They got 31,000 people diagnosed in the last 24 hours. And remember, you know, it is not clear, you know, how good they are in doing diagnostics. It's a very large population there. So Brazil is clearly out of control. Um, the Middle East, we never talk about the Middle East until this week. The Middle East, also they have a smaller population. They have the highest case per million, which means they have uh, a basically a, a drastic increase in number of cases. And so, so, so unfortunately you can see is that as Europe is slowing down, you see the virus is expanding. And of course, India, we talked about a bit earlier there, you know, is, is, is not a huge amount, but it's clearly a dangerous area there because there's over a billion people. So if you look at the growth, and the way you do that is week by week comparison. Uh, and you can see that Africa, which used to be really in, in, in the green colors, is not in the blue colors, is not popping up. And you can see several parts of Africa who have really exponential growth. India and Nepal have emerged. And Venezuela, we never talk about Venezuela. So unfortunately, the virus is going to the Southern Hemisphere. And that was the big worry we all had is that there's a large population, high density, poor population there with a lot of comorbidity factor and poor access of healthcare who cannot shut down the economy like we did. So we need to keep an eye on that. Um, South America has a new hotspot. This is a picture of Brazil. I mean, they have such a high mortality rate. I mean, you know, it's, it's really sad to see what they're doing uh, to bury people there. But Chile, Chile and Peru are now passing Brazil. In, in the cases per million, remember we want to normalize the data so we can see the infection rate and how quickly it's spreading there. Um, so that's really a concern. And then we start to have Mexico, Ecuador, the whole Central America now is starting to spread. So that's not a good news because we now are beyond the possibility of controlling these hotspots. It will go for the population. So if you look at the daily number of deaths, you can see that Mexico and Chile uh, are unfortunately now, as well as Brazil, the area there where on the mortality rate per million, they have a higher rate than the US. And God knows we're not doing that great. So if you look at the fatality rate, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, Belgium, as you know, has the highest fatality rate, uh, around 16%. But you can start to see, and this compared to South Korea and Iceland, who were able to control uh, the, the, the virus very early there. So there is a way to control it. And look at the difference between 2% mortality rate versus some of the European country. You may have seen in the news that Sweden has finally recognized that 
living the virus and, and try to get herd immunity did not work out. And now they're starting to take some action, unfortunately, very, very late uh, to decrease the mortality rate on the elderly populations there. So the Swedish experiments did not work. So let's take a look at traveling the world. You can see where it's going up, Brazil, India, Peru. There's a second wave in Iran. You may have watched that in the news. So unfortunately, Iran opened up very quickly there, too quickly. And basically, they had, you can see they were on the way down, and they went straight back up. And that's the worry we have for the US, because in the US, we never went down. We're in a plateau, and we're reopening up. So we have to see what's going to happen to us. Mexico, Pakistan, Bangladesh, big population all on the upswing. Uh, Israel, I was talking to some of the company I'm uh, in Israel and they're having a, a little bit of an up, up curve. So they're trying to control it right now. Uh, where new cases are decreasing, most of Europe is under control. You can see they're pretty much close to back to normal. So that's great news for, the, for Europe. They did a good job coordinating with each other. Uh, where it's flat, unfortunately, is the US and we're reopening. You can see a bit of an uptick going on. Russia is having a huge problem too. Um, they initially were late, so they thought they were kind of protected there. Unfortunately, that did not happen. So you can see, you know, uh, the whole world is unfortunately fighting this. If you look at the mortality per million, this hasn't changed much, but I want to explain about this number there. If you look at Belgium, they have the highest, one of the highest mortality of 824 people per million, which is significant for a country of only 10 million, roughly two and a half X to US and, and maybe a twice the rest of Europe. But this is interesting here that just came out. So Belgium is recognizing not only the people who have been tested positive, but they use the medical judgment of the doctor to classify people who have had COVID. So for example, in nursing home, less than 5% of the people who die were tested just because they were overwhelmed with a diagnostic. But the medical judgment of the physician is that they had all the symptoms of COVID. So they report that. So now they did an analysis showing, well, if you look at the normal mortality, which is the dotted line for this time of the year, based on historical death rate, and you can see there was an increase in COVID and they reported an increase, which is pretty much the same size. Now, if you look, let's say at New York, and New York reported the red line of COVID, but we know that 1.5X more people died during that period versus the seasonal expected death. And I think there is a, there is a belief that Belgium is truly reporting the true mortality due to COVID, which could be people who die from COVID, but they were not diagnosed, therefore not counted. In a lot of the state in the US, they don't count the mortality of nursing home, which we know is roughly 40 to 50% of the mortality in the US is from nursing homes. And then on top of that, you have people who have delayed care because they were afraid to go to the hospitals who may have died because they delayed care and they may end up with a stroke or heart attack. So the question is Europeans now are starting to change the way they're doing reporting to include people who were suspicious to have died due to COVID as opposed to people who have been positively diagnosed. And the way you look at that is you look at the normal curve of what the mortality should have been and how much they reported. In the Netherlands, you know, they were under reporting and so did the UK, you can see the Delta there. So now there is a movement in Europe to basically say we need to review and relook on how we define a COVID death because it was totally underreported. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we, 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 I shared the data that Epic, which is the largest medical healthcare records in hospitals in the US, and they did an analysis the same way, which is what should have been the mortality at this time of the year. And they find out we were underreporting by 1.5X. So there's 100,000 deaths in the US. There's an extra 50,000 deaths that were not counted that were related to COVID, which were unexplained uh, based on the seasonal mortality rate we should have. So, so the fact that Belgium has a high mortality rate may be because they are the only one who reported correctly. It's kind of the argument here. Let's look at the US. This is a scary thing. Since I talked to you last week, we've had an extra 200,000 cases in the US. And now we have gone up in the mortality rate where last week it was around 900 cases per day to now we've passed a thousand deaths per day. So, so it's really sad because these are real people uh, that have died. We're gonna pass 2 million cases probably sometime next week in the US. And it's everywhere. You can see it's really spread out for the whole country there. So let's take a deeper dive. 26,000 deaths, so roughly 25% of the deaths in the US are in nursing homes. 
And again, I emphasize a lot of these deaths are not necessarily reported because they don't necessarily test all those patients there. And uh, over 20% of the nursing home have reported at least one death. And so, and then the bad news is that there's a lot of the staffers are getting sick and dying. So they're having a problem in staffing the nursing home. So, uh, so keep an eye on that. So if we look at the mortality of the US, what's really interesting, if you look at Belgium and if you look at the percent of the deaths that were below the age of 65 years old, roughly it was 8%. It was mostly the elderly population that died. Now, if you look at the US, it's 30% of the deaths reported that are below the age of 65. And again, it could be because they're underreporting the death in nursing home in the US. There are some states who don't include it. So we may be underreporting the true mortality rate and therefore bias the age group to a younger population there. Um, so we basically 3x the mortality rate before the age of 65. So clearly something may be due to the data as opposed to we, we kill younger people there. Uh, as you know, the black American population there has a 2.4x higher mortality rate. It's usually due to the social demographics. Uh, the Navajo, the Indian population is 7x. Now remember, they have a higher obesity, diabetic and hypertension. So it's a lot of the comorbidity there. And then of course, New York had the big hits so of 41% of the reported deaths in the US, you know, are from New York and New Jersey there. But again, keep in mind that, you know, we have most of the people are, are people over the age of 65, but we have that, that spot here uh, in the US, which is we haven't seen in Europe. Now to get perspective, as the number gets so big, it's really hard to get a handle of 100,000 deaths. And I used that slide last week, but I want to reuse it this week because in a period of three months, we have killed as many people, or a virus has killed as many people as during World War I in the period of two years. Now think about this for a second there. In basically in three months, we killed the equivalent of people who died in horrific deaths during World War I in 24, in, in 24 months. We may be the way we're going, very close to some of the World War II, where we have passed Vietnam and Korea and all added up together the way we're going. And so, so it, is, it is something that's impacting the country in a way that I don't think we fully digested. So I, I put this slide and I'm updating it because the Europe, as you see, has done a good job in getting a slope. It's a little bit slower than the ascent, but you know, as a result of that, the mortality rate now is under control. You can see the US, we are going downwards, but the slope was not at the speed of Europe. And as we're opening up, we're gonna know in the next couple of weeks if we have a serious uptick. And in fact, if you go state by state, you're going to see we do have a couple of problems. If we get rid of New York, which clearly New York is under control as well as New Jersey, what you see is the US as a group is flat and on an uptick for the last couple of weeks. And if you look at the number of state, Look at the change, Arizona, Virginia, Alabama, on a week to week basis, they're all going up. So, so as we're reopening the states and on top of that, you have the riots, you can see that we have a long list of states and I just took all the states that were in the positive side and that's as of last Sunday. I got a bit more recent data coming up. This is an interesting uh, new uh, graphic, which basically look in every state based on the map of the US. So this is Maine and this is California. And what you want is showing the growth rate um, over the last two weeks, so it's kind of been smooth out. And you can see that there is a couple of areas there, you know, that are the don't take, but most of them are flat on the uptick. So we need to keep an eye on that because we may have the country as a whole going up. And two weeks ago, when I showed this graphic, which is showing the R no, which is the ratio of how many people who are infected, how many people they contaminate. So if you're one infected person, before uh, the virus was trying to be contained, it was around 2.5 people get infected by that person. That's the ratio of 2.5. In order to stop the pandemic to grow, you want to be below one. If you remember two weeks ago, we had only two states and they were just at 1.0 or something. Since we have reopened the last two weeks, we have gone from two states to 12 states. And this is kind of a key number to keep track because all those area there, you can see this big area in Arkansas and Montana and Georgia and Florida, you know, uh, these are some of the very, you know, high population state, um, you know, are on the upswing and probably next two weeks, we may get more of some of this going up. So that's something that's worrisome because that may be, we may get a second mini wave. 
Uh, if you look at the cases by week, again, it's a nice way to see if we have an uptick. California, unfortunately, we'll talk more about this, is on the uptick. Uh, mostly Los Angeles is the area. We're having a bit of a hot spot going on in LA. Texas, Florida, Maryland, Virginia, all opened up and had minimum restriction. They all going back up. So that's a concern. Uh, there's clearly an upswing going on in certain states. If you look at the hot spot in the last two weeks, the whole Southeast is getting from orange to red. It is getting, unfortunately, with hot spots, not necessarily for the whole state, but if you look at the area, it's a lot of the high density area that are flaring up. And of course, in Northern California, in Northern California it's fine, but in Southern California, Los Angeles is the issue in, in California. Where the kids are increasing? California, unfortunately. Right? We'll spend more time on that. But Texas, Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, these are states who were, who were you know, under control a couple of weeks ago, and unfortunately, you see the uptick. There are some states, some states are doing well. New York, New Jersey, they clearly did a good job. They have a 20% herd immunity there. And that is clearly slowing down the spread of the virus there. If you look at the death per million, this is interesting. New York used to be 20 times California and now it dropped to 15 times California. So we're having an uptick in California and a drop in New York. Illinois, who wasn't really there before, has now popped up. Uh, with a uh, you know a pretty significant higher mortality rate compared to other states, Massachusetts you know had a problem before we knew that, so we're having some new states pop popping up there that we didn't have a couple of weeks ago. So if you look at um, sorry I went too fast the worst outbreak we do this week to week you can see the name of the cities are changing. And you can see that two weeks ago that we're mostly in, in the light blues and the light oranges. In the last week, we now go to darker colors, which clearly shows an increase uh, of some of the hot spots, both in the number of new cases in the last two weeks and new deaths in the last two weeks. So we need to keep an eye on that because these are like medium-sized cities there, not necessarily the large ones. But we're clearly having the virus spreading throughout America, especially the, the, the middle of the country. Next hot spot, same thing. Um, you know, the most, you know, Utah and Texas. Uh, all those medium-sized cities there are having some, some activities. This is a new dashboard for California. And, and based on the requirement to reopen the state, one of the idea is to be able to do 30,000 diagnostics per 100,000. Sorry, 30 diagnostic per 100,000 there. We clearly, as we know, California has a testing problem there. So we're not meaning that, but we're at least increasing it. Uh, the rate in California of people who are positive when you take a test is 4.6%, which, which is perceived to be the prevalence of the antibodies in the, in, in the population there. People have been exposed. If you look at the number of tests per day, we start to go up, so we're doing a good job there, and we have a lot of ICU beds available. The hospitals are not at full capacity. So if there's a second wave coming up, we're ready there. And, and so the California you know, is doing a good job in controlling that. And if you're interested, if you're in different states, uh, you can click on this link here and then look at every state just to see how that works. Um, California, as you know, has, you know, was improving there and now we've been an uptick in the mortality rate. If you look at this area, it's all about Los Angeles. Uh, you can see the mortality rate in Los Angeles is significantly higher and are basically ranked by the death rate per 100,000. And you can look at Los Angeles, and I'm gonna to try to find Santa Clara, it is over here, it's significantly higher. If you look at the mortality per 100,000, they have a you know four times, three to four times higher mortality rate per 100,000 uh, that we have in Santa Clara. So you need to look not on the number of cases, but the mortality rate on a normalized basis there. In San Francisco, is in great shape for people in San Francisco here. Uh, if you look at the number of cases, that's the bad news. It's clearly on the upswing. We haven't control. And again, it's not Northern California. It's all about Los Angeles and San Diego area there. So, so that's unfortunate. Uh, and now I broke it down by the counties here. And if you look at it, the standard to reopen was to have 2.5 cases per 10,000. Uh, and you can see that Santa Clara is in good shape. So is Santa Cruz. But Alameda, as you may have seen in the news for the last one to two weeks, has had a bit of a upsurge in the number of cases there. 
uh, in San Francisco, you know, is, you know, kind of flat, but clearly Alameda is kind of a new area there as well as San Mateo. These are the two counties in the Bay Area there that have given an uptick. Uh, so the question in California is that are we flat down or up? And clearly we fought for a while we were flat over here. And unfortunately over the last several weeks, the trend is playing on the upward side. Los Angeles hey, is the problem. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> You know, California had a slow start on testing. Uh, how much of that growth in new cases is distorted by uh, a rapid increase in testing, do you That's think? Question. This is why I ranked on this slide by the death rate. Because the death rate is a hard number as opposed to the ability of doing the testing. And clearly, if you look at the death rate, Los Angeles is worth. If you look at the test rate, which is the last column here, uh, you can see that the death in the test rate in Los Angeles compared to Santa Clara is better. So they're doing a better job just because I think they have a, they have a bit of a hot spot going on. But we clearly, and San Francisco is the best. San Francisco did the best uh, uh, diagnostic, which may mean that they were able to, to isolate uh, the, the cases maybe earlier. So, so the issue we're having is not just the fact that we're just improving the testing because it looks on the average, I don't know, I have the slide here, but on the average, our detection rate is 4.5%. And also we're increasing, and I think it's one of the slides coming up, we're increasing the number of tests, the diagnostics is, is, is staying around 4.5% are positive. So, so the other thing that's interesting, if you look at the positive cases, the Latino, are significantly higher than 54% of the people are tested positive, and they're significantly higher percentage that they're mixing the population. And that's reflecting the fact that they have to work outside, so they have a higher chance to be exposed. They work in higher density, you know, usually three to five people in the household. Uh, and then the white population, who is significantly lower, if you look here, 19%, than the mix of the population there. So it's really more social demographics as opposed to uh, to, to the you know genetics. Uh, the number of ICU was dropping for a while and then we had this uptick. Uh, most of that is due to Los Angeles. Uh, so, so just as a refresher for everybody, uh, we've been trying to understand this virus and literally every week we have paper being published on how the virus works. And we'll talk a bit more about in detail. We first found that the virus was attacking the lungs and that was kind of the way people were dying because they couldn't transfer oxygen and then they had the CO2 uh, transfer. And we discovered the CO2 transfer was working fine. And so they were able to get rid of the CO2, but then they had what's called a happy hypoxia where they had really low level of oxygen and they were really hurting their organ. Um, and now we, I'm going to talk about some of the things that just came out. We discovered a lot of these people there having you know, damage to the liver there with abnormal liver da damage, which now seems to be staying longer after they've recovered. We now have discovered that it's it's attacking to the to, attaching to the ACE2 receptors, which is going to have some consequence. I'm going to share, which impacts unfortunately the heart, the blood vessels, uh, and the intestine. And we now know it goes into the uh, to the brain via the blood-brain barrier, which explains some of this long-term inflammatory response that some people are taking months to recover from. Not everybody, but some people are. And what is very clear is the loss of smell and taste is the most critical determinant that you may have been exposed. It's really the first special indication that people have before they start having problem with breathing or temperature. So keep an eye on that. So what they have discovered, and this is some really interesting uh, graphics, is that the virus is disrupting the blood vessels. Uh, there's now more and more evidence that it's attacking what's called the endothelial cells. That's the inside of the cell of your blood uh, arteries or, or blood veins. And as a result of that, there's a response of the body that creates an uncontrolled blood clotting. So let me share some of the data. So uh, there was a, a autopsies of people. Uh, it's published by New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the best uh, magazine or trade journals in the US. And they look at people uh, who died and they did the autopsy. And what they discovered is that the people who had died, they had nine times higher level of these what's called microtrombi, which is this tiny little blood cells. You can see some of the picture here if, if, if you're a physician there. And it's clearly uh, if, with a P of 0 0.001, is 
statistically very significant. It's one of the marker of people who are losing control of their cytokine spore, uh, storm. And the other thing that just got published is that they've always been trying to figure out why some people at day seven after they've been exposed are recovering and some people lose control of their um, immune system response, which we have talked about in the past called the cytokine response. And what they have discovered, and this, this just got published in Science Magazine uh, by University of Zurich. And they show that after they do some analysis that the capillaries of the lungs are loaded with these tiny clot and dead cells. And it's basically what they've come to the conclusion is that the, the SARS, you know, basically connect into the cells it creates in, in, in inside what's called the alveola of, of the lungs there. It goes inside the blood vessels and it creates this inflammation response. And the body is responding to this with a fibrin response, which is a diagnostic type four, which is the one that's nine times higher than normal. And that is what's creating a platelet reaction with its blood clots. And that's why you see a 30 years old with a massive stroke or heart attack because of a reaction to the virus. So we're starting to learn this cascade of injury. And so one of the questions that people are asking themselves, and we're probably know in the next several, maybe several weeks, could products like statins or products that can regulate or inhibit clotting and prevent inflammation, could they decrease at the response? So if people test positive, you know, could these people take some of these drugs to minimize that response at seven to 10 days? So, so what's amazing about this virus is literally every week, we're still trying to learn the mechanism of action of how it works. Uh, so that's a very important thing. So the other thing we're discovering is that if you remember when you look at the old SARS, which is the old cousins of the coronavirus that came out in the year 2003, and the new one, we have these little spikes as we call it there, and they call this the loop. And they believe that these loops are critical in their mechanism of action to connect to the ACE2, uh, which is how they attach into the cell. And so the hope is that if we could block these receptors, that this virus, if somebody has been exposed and before the virus was really out of control in the first three days, after you, of three to five days after you've been exposed, can we use some of these two inhibitors to basically block the attachment to the cell? So the good news is as we are understanding better and better how this disease and this virus is attacking the body, we are trying to reuse existing drugs because now we're trying to stop the mechanism before it gets into this explos explosive growth of the virus within the body. This is for the, my, my, my scientific people on the group here. So the good news is that Maria van Kerkhoven, who is the technical lead for the coronavirus for the World Health Organization, just came out yesterday showing that it is mutating, but is not mutating in a way that makes it more fatal or more infectious. And it is mutating in part of the gene because they do the gene analysis that will not be impacted by the vaccine. So the good news is that if we get a vaccine that works on this virus, it seems that so far the area that's mutating is not the area where the vaccine will basically stop the progression of the virus. And just for the fun of it, I put you all the mutation. You can keep track of it. Like Belgium is in that, that, that type of blue. But you can see that this virus that started in Asia, they had already 71 uh, mutations there has been spreading in Europe and North America and continue to mutate. And there was this big worry that there's like we're, like we're on 200 mutations of the virus, can we develop the vaccine? So it was kind of good news so far that the mutation are you know more into the aesthetic or you know but not really affecting the mortality, the infection rate, and hopefully the area where we are basically trying to bind. Uh, to basically block the virus. So that's kind of good news. And you can, you know, just at the front of it, these are papers, you can pay attention to it. Um, now in Europe and in, in Australia, they've discovered that you can predict a hotspot in the SARS if you do the analysis of the sewing concentration area there where they do the processing of the plant. And it seems to be a direct correlation between an increase in the, in the presence of SARS in the sewage system which has been treated so they can do the analysis and predict them, uh, the new cases within a couple of weeks. So the good news is that if we start analyzing some of these sewage reprocessing plan, we may be able to predict hotspots and, and at least isolate the population, do something about it. And Australia is leading the way in some of these efforts. Uh, transmission. 
So remember we talk about uh, talking is kind of really kind of a slow amount of, of droplets that goes out there, you know, and breathing is like five to 50 to 5,000 droplets. And that is also the size of the droplets. But if you sneeze, if you scream, if you sink, you know, this droplet can drive up to 200 miles per hour. One of the problems that's going on right now with, with some of the protests is that between the tear gas that increase, uh, you know, you having, you know, tears, which, you know, are contaminated, the smoke, uh, which basically blow the wind around, and the yelling and the screaming and the close distancing, these are petri dishes, unfortunately, for the virus uh, to basically expand. And so we probably know two weeks from now if a lot of the demonstration we've seen in the last week, you know, may have an impact on the virus kind of uptick in the area there. So if you, I want to gather this interesting statistics and analysis about the probability of you uh, being infected. If you're talking on the walk, and just for the fun of it, and if you pass 10 people there and every breath is a cough, yes, you could be exposed, but most people, they may have a mask, pretty much no chances. They may just breathe normally, no mass there. So these are very, very low probabilities you can see there. Uh, on the other hand, if you go into a crowd where there's thousands of people, and statistically some people will be breathing there, you can see the probability gets to be pretty dangerous there. If you stay six foot away, that, that distance makes a big difference. So clearly distance, I mean, I, I, you know, is really important there as well as the mask. If you talk about, um, if you stay, so it's a question, how long do you stay with somebody and how many people are in the room? These are the two key variables to see your exposure there. And, and then the type of interaction if they're coughing versus just talking there. And you can see where it gets to be dangerous is that if you are with a large group of people for over an hour or even 15 minutes there, if you are just talking with friends that you know are basically, you know, being good behavior in the last couple of months there, you're pretty much a very low risk there. And if you're basically just talking, it's a very low risk. If somebody has coughing there, this is when the risk is. So I'm, I'm just trying to provide reassurance there that we should not get paranoid as we try to reopen. And you may have groups of friends you want to talk to because pretty much it's perceived to be pretty safe as long as somebody doesn't have any symptoms. Uh, that's the first analysis I've seen there, you know, to say, well, should we be paranoid and everybody you pass with your dogs barking, uh, you know, or, you know, is there, you know, what should, what should you worry about? Masks do work. This is an interesting analysis that was done in Wuhan. They tested 10 million people. They test the whole population in the last several weeks. They test over 90% of people. They literally went door to door and there's not one ongoing coronavirus transmission going on right now. They were able to stop all the little flare up that they had in the last couple of weeks by forcing everybody to wear a mask. And they were able to show for analysis that you can really drop drastically the exposure rate if the person that is sending the droplet, you know, wears a mask, but it's not for you to be protected, it's for the person who is asymptomatic. That's always the big concern with this disease is 30 to 50% of the population is asymptomatic and may be uh, projecting particles there. So do wear a mask. Are we close to herd immunity? And remember we talked about with the virus having an R north of 2.5, we need to get a minimum of 60% of the population to have a herd immunity up to 90% to stop the spread of the virus. And if you look at Sweden, who basically let it go to see what happened, well, they only got 7.3% of their population to have antibodies. So they didn't get herd immunity. They did have a high mortality rate. New York got really hit hard, uh, very badly there, and I'm between 20 to 25 percent. I think Manhattan is 25 percent uh, recently there. So, so that's an issue there. Wuhan was able to stop it with only 10 percent of the population having antibody. So, I think we just need to accept the fact that for a while, until we get a vaccine, we need to take protective steps, which is social distance and mask whenever you think you could be exposed, because herd immunity is not a come naturally. So how do we track epidemic? Uh, I, I was invited to a webinar that was very interesting on some of the latest things. And what they show, for example, in New York is that they're keeping track uh, of the cell phone and they can keep track of how people are doing social distancing in a pretty granular way. And, and, so, and so, so there's a lot of this uh, tracking uh, software that exists and then there's a whole issue of privacy. So right now it's on an unidentified basis there, but question, Will we allow people to 
physically be on an identified basis to tell you, you know, you've been exposed in the last five days to somebody who was positive and you want to know the information exchange of giving up some of your privacy there. Um, and so uh, this is an interesting analysis uh, in China where they're able to show that using social media, they could predict the COVID cases. And they're using this tool in China without asking permission because in China they can do that to really be able to force people to enter information every day before they go into a building. They have to fill up a questionnaire. What's your temperature? Do you have any symptoms there? They have to share some of their data. And they have like a, uh, like, a, like a certain code that they have to show there. So will we go to that level in the US? That's something, but that's what they're doing in Asia basically look at the next flare up and control it. This is the question I was asked earlier. You can see we're doing a better job in the US in the number of testing. So we're clearly going up. And if you look at the number of positive tests, that was, you know, it is kind of going down a tiny bit there as we're going up there. So it's not like we had a huge change in that number there, which may be a function we had missed so many people before. And it's staying between three to 4% of the tests are positive. Uh, when and what to do for testing, remember, depending where you are from the time of exposure, you know, there's different type of tests. The first test after you've been exposed is the famous PCR test. And that is the one that they, they, they do the analysis of the genome of the viral load that they pick up from nasal swab. And remember, the, 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 the test cannot distinguish between a contagious, alive virus and a dead cell. And there's a belief that a lot of these cases that flare up in, your, in, in Asia, where people are still shedding dead cells from their lungs, and they are not infections, but they still have the viral load that gets detected. So, so just be aware of that, that the PCR will be positive up to four weeks. It has been measured on people up to 29 days after discharge from the hospital, but they believe it's because these are dead cells, but it's still the virus that is still being measured. After that period of time, the PCR will probably turn negative, and then you look at the antibody detection. And then remember, the key one is the IgG, which is the one that usually takes a, the peak is at 21 days after after you've been exposed. So, so be aware that it, you know you cannot add these these tests together. And unfortunately, the thing that came out the last couple of weeks is the CDC, as well as eight other states, were adding all these tests together, really giving a false sense of what the true diagnostic situation was in the US. Now they're in the process of repurposing their data and cleaning it up there, but that was kind of a bit of a mess there, kind of disappointing for the CDC. The good news, you know, the number of treatment and vaccine is going up every week for people who have been following me. Uh, and there's a lot of different approaches, which is what we need. We need different type of approach to have a higher chance of success. Uh, there was an interesting uh, webinar. I got invited there with Moderna, which is the hottest uh, vaccine that's being worked on right now, and Merck and Amgen. And these are some of the takeaway that came up. 90% uh, of the people are still at risk of being infected. So despite the fact we had this huge wave that kind of hurt a lot of people, remember, you know, less than four to 10% of people have developed antibodies. Therefore, it's still an approach we need to protect ourselves for the next 12 months at least, you know, until there's maybe a vaccine with mass clean hand and social distancing. That's here to stay. Uh, in the case of Merck, they're using old vaccine technology because they want to use existing manufacturing process that they can scale up to billions of those very quickly. Then we have to get to 7 billion people in the world vaccinated. It is a task that has never been done before. So we need to have an ability of making this vaccine in very high quality. And in a way they don't have to be refrigerated and they can be distributed everywhere in the world. So there is, what came out of this was very interesting. They all said the same thing. Not one vaccine, we fix everything. We're gonna need different vaccines for different population. And the rule of thumb that came out is that we need at least five different vaccines. And, and Amgen said the same thing, Amgen and Lilly. Uh, they are developing a different approach, which is to identify the B cell, which is your immune system, and to isolate them and be able to re-inject them uh, into your body there, so monoclonal antibody types, and um, to basically activate uh, 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 your immune system there using maybe injection every two to four weeks. So you're gonna see things that it's not one shot and this is over. It's gonna be multiple vaccination, multiple approach, depending of your age groups, the locations where you are and everything else. 
Uh, Moderna talked a little bit there. Uh, they're creating that mRNA uh, messenger, which has to be injected. It probably has to be injected twice at minimum is what they're doing right now in their protocols. They now has started last Friday, um, their phase two with 600 patients. They're planning to do uh, thousands of patients starting in July. This is the one that got a lot of money from the US government. Uh, it came out, the technology came out of the NIH and it's being tested uh, by the NIH uh, with Dr. Fauci there. The big issue there is the long-term safety in 10 years. How can we test in 12 months a 10 year safety? Uh, and so nobody could answer that question there. So um, there's a lot of concern about, you know, how do we know if it's safe, you know, versus traditional vaccine, you know, we have a lot of experience on this vaccine works and how to make them. So just to- Excuse me, Anne. Yeah. You had talked earlier about vaccinations and you had a prognosis, a potential prognosis of having something ready in 2028. But the Wall Street Journal webinar, the people who are talking on it has have a different time frame. Yeah, so if you remember the, the prior presentation, historically, it has shown, in fact, it's right here. If you look historically, uh, it takes between 16 to 28 years to get a new vaccine done. And we're never able to do one for HIV. We, if we bring the, the, there was an interactive website in some of the prior slides that uh, of the prior weeks that shows um, uh, if you basically decrease some of the traditional safety tests and a whole bunch of our traditional tests that we do, we could probably do it in several years. And what we're trying to do is even break that record into 18 months. The consensus from all the experts is that the 18 months is the best scenario. Now you have to keep in mind that if you look at the probability of developing a vaccine, historically, it hasn't been that great. Now the good news is for infection disease, we historically had a 35% success rate. Another way of saying is that two thirds of the time we're not able to find a vaccine. So I think, you know, we, we, I mean, the expectation we're gonna get a vaccine in 12 to 18 months and one silver bullet is a low probability. What you hear these experts talking is that we're probably going to get AstraZeneca, Lilly, Merck, all of that developing different approach. And, and you, you're going to need several of these vaccines to be approved, hopefully, with some different type of safety data there. And then your doctor is going to use a cocktail or depending who you are and your pre-existing condition and your age group, they're going to do recommendation. But, but the silver bullet to come in, coming by the end of this year is a very low probability. Nobody knows. But what you hear is that the people who are basically they're doing parallel tracking. So AstraZeneca announced yesterday they're going to be ready to do 2 billion doses by the end of this year using traditional method and working with Oxford. This is the, the technology you may have heard about that they, they did on, on chimpanzee or, or some monkeys there. Now we have to bring it to the human phase and we're doing parallel development instead of serial development over time. So everybody's taking massive gambles that, um, that we, we we can get this vaccine earlier, but nobody knows to be honest with you. And remember this different approach. I just listed them here. You know, you can see different company are doing different approach. This is to give you an idea of where we are. Um, uh, these are preclinical, so that means we're doing tests uh, on, on cells or, or, um, or animals. This is the phase one, which is the safety data. We do very low dose and you're making sure there's no uh, reaction there. And this is the phase one, two which you can see there's several companies there, the AstraZeneca and the Moderna, probably the one that's the furthest uh, in, in the progressions there. Uh, there's efforts across the world. Uh, some are coordinating it, some are not. So there's a lot of effort there. China is doing it, the Europeans are doing it with AstraZeneca in the UK, Moderna is based in the US. So there's multiple shots on goal and we're probably gonna need multiple shots on goals. Uh, there was a conversation with Dr. Fauci and he talked about the fact that there's 146 vaccines are being tested right now. Uh, for example, uh, Moderna is expecting to do 100 million doses by the end of 2020, 30 million doses for uh, the, uh, the UK, and they've promised 300 million doses for the US, but we don't know if it works yet. So right now everybody's doing parallel tracking. They're starting to build and making the dose, hoping it works. Uh, the test right now, the phase three is going to be 30,000 people between the age of 15 and 55 starting midsummer. The question is, how do you expose people to the virus? Um, and then we have to make sure there's enough antibodies that's being created. Remember the data I showed last week is that if you look at people who had been exposed to the virus who were survivors there, a third of these people didn't have enough antibodies to be measured. 
and you have to make sure the right antibodies. And then we don't know how long it's going to last. The expectation is that you're going to have to be like the flu vaccine. You're going to be have, basically have to do this probably on an annual basis. Um, and who gets the vaccine first? Uh, Dr. Fashi says we're probably going to give it to the healthcare worker first because they're the one who will be exposed, then the elderly, then to people with underlying conditions. Um, and then uh, initially it's going to be the CDC, but since the CDC has, is not really equipped to do that, uh, they're also working with the DOD to do the logistics as well as pharma companies. So logistics of doing, giving this to 300 million Americans is not going to be straightforward. And then there was an interesting question they asked, they say, what happened if China gets it first? There's a really serious concern about what's called vaccine nationalism, where people make the vaccine and refuse to export and use this politically for different aims. And there's clearly not very good collaboration between the US and China in sharing data on the development of the vaccine. I think there's better collaboration uh, with Europe. Uh, other comments there is that uh, the virus is much more transmissible than the original SARS that we had in 2003. And, and um, the only way we can control the virus right now is containment and distance in the mask. Um, there was a question about, could you be exposed to the vaccine? And as a result of that, I have a higher chance to develop the cytokine response, which around 20 people get. He perceived that there was not gonna be a risk because uh, the way the vaccine are working, uh, it will not overstimulate the immune system. Um, and so African-Americans, you know, he confirmed have a, a, a higher mortality and higher exposure there. And he absolutely said the virus will come back next winter. I mean, not initially politically people say, well, maybe, but I think pretty much now that it moves to South America and the Southern hemisphere there, we should expect another wave next winter. Uh, the good news is there is a, a, a new antibody therapy that's being tested by Lilly. Uh, they call this the Lucky Triple Five. And it's being tested in New York City, Los Angeles, and Atlanta. And if effective, it could be available by the autumn. This is a drug therapy. It's not a vaccine. In other words, it is something that will help you fight the, the virus if you get exposed. Uh, it's a collaboration with a biotech company in Canada. And what they did is that they went after people who had recovered and they did massive analysis of their blood and they identified a certain type of antibody that was generated by the people recovered. And that's the one they're making to inject it into you and when you're sick. So it's what's called a monoclonal antibody, which is not cheap and probably will only be used on people who end up in a hospital as opposed to people with you know, 80% that have mild cases uh, in, in, uh, at the home. Eli Lilly is really, again, like I said, that usually the biotech company do an agreement with a very large pharma so they can basically invest probably billions of dollars in building this manufacturing capacity there and people are scaling up before they even know if the vaccine works. So people are taking massive gambles. Uh, a new data just came out this week on convalescent, convalescent plasma. If you remember what they do is that they take the blood of somebody who's recovered, they basically uh, get it through a machine there and they extract what's called the plasma, which is that yellow liquid that comes out of that and when, when they get rid of some of the red cells. And that's getting the antibody of somebody who has recovered. And then they inject this into somebody who's sick. And that was a hope we had for people really fighting in the ICU and really in bad shape. Could that be a quick boost to help you uh, basically survive? And unfortunately the data, and again, this was a, a, a limited amount of patients, uh, under patients in, in China, is that there was not statistically a big difference. Uh, there was uh, some statistic difference for people with severe versus the critically ill. In other words, if you were on the ventilator really, really ill, it doesn't really help you. If you were just before that, you know, it did help a little bit there. So there's gonna be more study being done, but that's, that, that was the first data coming out on, on the plasma there that has come out there. So that, we we're hoping that was gonna be a big shot. And right now, as we're discovering with this virus vaccine, you know, with this virus, there is no silver bullet. Okay, hydroxychloroquine, this is the, the saga that's continued to go out. If you remember, we talked last week that the Lancet had published this really big paper there on 96,000 people showing that it did not work. Not only didn't work, but you had a high mortality. They officially retracted that yesterday. And they retracted that, which is very, very, very rare, uh, because um, they, were in the, they were getting the data from a private company who was not willing to share the data. 
And so there's a lot of suspicion there that we don't know the quality of the data and if it's reliable. So it's very unheard that the authors, which is Harvard, basically request the Lancet to retract that paper. It's very rare. Uh, so as a result of that, the World Health Organization had stopped all the trial last week because they said ethically we could not do trials if we know we increase in mortality, and now restarting the trials that they had stopped last week. So to be seen. On the other hand, another paper came out yesterday from New England Journal of Medicine, which is a high quality paper, using the University of Minnesota on 821 high-risk healthcare workers, so they were exposed there, and they basically gave it to them four days after exposure and they follow them for 14 days. So the idea was to give it to people when they're still not very, very sick, but we know they have been exposed. And what it shows is that it didn't really change the outcome. 12% uh, developed COVID uh, and 14% in placebo group. So, so there was the hope that if you give hydroxy earlier, that may be an infect. So we pretty much have done it early when they are in the ICU, when they are ventilators and right now, it's not very clear cut if it works. So it's more, more being published in the coming weeks. But so far, I will say it doesn't work. Uh, some good news is that telehealth has exploded. It's expected to be used 20% of the time. So now everybody's very comfortable to using televisits and, and diagnostic at home and all of the other things, which I think will be hopefully uh, something to stay. This is a McKinsey story saying that the number of visits and office visits has been totally taken over by telehealth, which is great. Um, this is an interesting data that, uh, that show um, if you have more restriction uh, versus the outcome, was there something that changed the output? And you can see, if you look at a lot of the countries like Belgium and all of that, you know, we had unfortunately a bad situation of shutting down the economy and having a high fatality rate. And then of course you have China, which I'm not sure if we can show some of the data there. Uh, and then you have, uh, other country there who basically, uh, you know, so, so people are starting to see is there a relationship between having high restriction, shutting down the economy, and severe restriction, and does it change the outcome? So you're going to see more data probably being published there to see, you know, is it worse to shut down the economy or, you know, the virus kind of goes for the population anyway. So keep an eye on that because you can see the light restriction here, they had bad outcome. And, and the people with severe restriction, uh, there was not a big difference in outcome. So keep an eye on that. So let's talk about the economy. As you know, we have had a, a massive drop in the economy there. There's gonna be some good news coming up quickly there. And uh, the CBO, which is the government arm for budget, they expect a 10 year recovery because we, keep it, we literally dropped 3% of GDP uh, in a matter of a couple of months. Uh, the good news is came today, and you can see the stock market exploded today, a big surprise, people were expecting 8 million jobs to be lost in the month of May. And lo and behold, we increased the number of jobs being created in the month of May by two and a half. So it's a swing of 10 million jobs. And, and I think that's what got people excited today in the stock market because it shows that the economy is starting to rehire and we may be from an economic point of view come back faster. That doesn't mean the mortality doesn't change, but the economy is coming back. Now you can see there's a difference between black and Hispanic who had a significantly higher, uh, you know, 16 to 20% unemployment rate as opposed to the white population there. And of course, you can see that a lot of the service producing uh, industry there is the one that got hit the hardest there. So you can see the stock market pretty much recovered to where we came from. So as we're tracking the reopening, uh, we, you can see that uh, vac vacation of booking of summer vacation is going straight back up. <laughs> people are, you know, uh, doing this. Mortgage application, new businesses, people, if they got unemployed, they start, they start companies, which is what we love about America. Uh, as far as traveling airplane, it's still very low, uh, like 90% down. Uh, so, but we're clearly reopening the economy. Uh, where are people going? They're going to fast food restaurants. They're not going to full services. Not a surprise. Um, maybe it's because you're able to pick it up from the car. I don't know. I'll be clearly part of the country there was very comfortable going to fast food and California were very kind of concerned. Um, if you know, looking at where we're we opening there, uh, clearly uh, fast food is coming back up. The barber uh, is coming back up. Movie theater shut down. AMC announced they may not survive. Uh, so we may have a problem in the, in the, in the movie industry there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about 
how do we handle this as human beings there? I mean, it is pretty overwhelming. I mean, we have a lot of issues about people you may know uh, that may have died. Uh, you have uncertainty about your job. You have uncertainty about safety in the street with riots. And, and so there's a lot of concern that, uh, you know, uh, if you look at social media, the coronavirus coverage dropped like a rock as we had the protests that basically took over, took over the news over the last week. And if you look at anxiety, and I'm talking not just feeling the blues, but serious anxiety and depression, it is estimated that a third of the US right now is clinically defined as having anxiety and depression there. And, 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 it, and it is a concern in that you probably see you know, some of the anger and explosion, uh, you know, if people have a problem controlling, controlling their emotion. Half the people in Mississippi have been basically showing serious symptoms of anxiety and depressions. And again, that may be tied to the social demographics, but also if you remember the hotspots, is in this area there in the Southeast. But even California is the third of the population. Uh, so who is anxious? It's across all the age group. But as we reported last week for another study, really keep an eye on your, on your kids and your teenagers. Uh, the, the, the young population there, they have, they have, you know, this is the biggest thing that has ever happened to them. I mean, we are old enough that we have seen a lot of cycles for life, and so we're much more resilient here. But really keep an eye on, on the young population. And that may be also one of the reasons you have all this anger being expressed in, in the street. And of course, it's based on the people who are, you know, having lost their job or uh, in, in the lower income bracket. So uh, it is a significant percent of the population. So we need to keep an eye on that. So crisis fatigue is showing everywhere. You know, you basically, a lot of people feel numb. Uh, they have these massive fight to flight syndromes there, which is the release of cortisol and adrenaline that gives you the extra kick for a couple of 20 minutes. But if you have this crisis response all day long as you're watching CNN <laughs> and reading the paper there, your body literally, you know, stop functioning normally. And it's affecting your brain decision making. What's happening is that you're no longer connecting to your frontal lobe, which is what helps you to make a good informed decision there. And don't say it's the fault of your spouse, I don't go into that. Uh, but what you need to be aware is that the chemical reaction in the brain means that your working memory is not working as effectively. So you cannot use experience from the past, especially as we're dealing with situations we have never faced before. There's a lot of unknown between the riots, a lot of the uh, political uh, crisis in the country there, this virus with the line of stuff. If we're gonna get a vaccine in eight months or three years, you know, it's things we have never faced. So it's be aware to be careful making hard decision there because your brain is not working normally. Now there's a long list of tips, you know, from deep breathing, you know, meditations, moderate exercise to deal with that. And I think you need to be gentle with yourself. Uh, I mean, you know, Stop criticizing your brain if you cannot make decisions because you may be the deer in the head like chemically in your brain right now. And you need to really be aware of that if, if you're making major decisions. I have a couple of doctors you know, uh, who I work with and they basically have decided to stop practicing medicine because they have been so exhausted on the front line. And, and I think part of that you know, is, is dealing with some of this chemical um, way of how your brain gets affected. So I think I'm gonna go into Q&A where I'll stop the recording.